Hello, it's been a while since the last episode. Sorry for that, but we're back here today. I hope at the very least you've been enjoying some of the other content on the channel. I've been really enjoying making my more longer form videos again. It's nice to get back into that. And I have a lot of great content planned for you guys for the future. Thanks to everyone who checked out that Ansu Fati video, by the way, such a talent that has experienced so much at such a young age. It's going slowly, but he's finding his form again. So if you don't follow Barcelona closely and you've been wondering, why haven't I heard about this guy a lot lately? I explain it all in there. Also with the Champions League back this week, watch alongs are back on the table. So join me on Tuesday and Wednesday live during the matches. Cool? All right, let's go. Oh, and one more thing, guys. I've been working with BR Football a lot more lately. Um, so I've also started posting on TikTok and Instagram again. So do be sure to follow me there. I will link to both my Instagram and my TikTok. If you're on TikTok, that is. If you want more short form videos, but if you don't migrate over to those channels, I do post some shorts on YouTube as well. Now, back in March and in early April, Inter looked like a broken team, and they were not fun to watch. Their patterns of play weren't exactly too, too bad, but their strikers were all out of form at the same time. I mean, Correa, more of a forward than a striker, I guess, but he has never really been at in form for Inter, at least not at the levels he was at for Lazio. But Dzeko, Lataro, and Lukaku were all struggling. But now, everyone in Inter is catching form at the same time, and they are looking like a very, very strong outfit once again to close out the season, right when they need to be in form. They have a Coppa Italia final coming, but before that, they have the Champions League semis against AC Milan, so keep an eye on these guys, especially since Inzaghi seems to be a bit of a cup specialist. This past weekend, they went up against another cup specialist in Jose Mourinho, but I think it's fair to say, and I, I don't mean to take anything from Inter here after just saying nice things about them, but it's fair to say that this wasn't the true Roma out there. The injuries that Mourinho has had to deal with lately has been out of this world. Cristante starting as center back, Madi Camara and Eduardo in the midfield, Belotti in the attack. If this was prime Belotti from Torino a few years ago, it wouldn't be seen as that bad, but he struggled at Roma. No Vinaldum, no Dybala, no Abraham. Anyway, like I said, depleted Roma or not, you still have to actually play the game and win it. And Inter went away to the Stadio Olimpico. One goal per half, one from DeMarco and one from Lukaku as the Lalu partnership got back up and running. Lotaro picking up a mistake and playing Lukaku through. Calm finish. 2-0 Inter. Juve also won 2-0 away to Atalanta as Illing Jr. got the start and scored in the first half. In the second, two substitutes in Vlahovic and Chiesa linked up to make it 2-0 in the 98th minute. Vlahovic finally getting his confidence back it seems and starting to score goals again. And with Pogba returning as well, there's hope for a nice finish to the season for Juve supporters and a little optimism for next season. Well, I still think Allegri is not the guy to elevate this Juventus side to the next level, but hey, that's just me. After their draw that was almost a win against Milan midweek, Cremonese did indeed get a victory over Spezia this weekend, 2-0. With four matches to go, I'll show the bottom of the table by the way, but with four matches to go, they have a chance at survival. Those three points against Spezia were massive because they're now uh, three points behind Spezia. <laughs> Speaking of Milan, they got a huge result against second place Lazio. Playing at home, first half strikes from Teo Hernandez and Benacer was enough to give them a 2-0 victory. However, I'm sure plenty of Milan fans will be pacing around nervously over the next few days as Rafael Leal went off injured in the 11th minute. As of now, it's sort of up in the air as to whether he'll make it or not. He hasn't been ruled out but there isn't overwhelming optimism either that he'll be playing against Inter in the Champions League. And the champions, Napoli, they played at home against Fiorentina and they got a guard of honor from their opposition and a hero's welcome from their supporters in what has been a mad few days of partying in the city. Such deserving winners. Sure, they fell out of form a bit recently, as many teams who had been leading for most of the season in their respective leagues have done. Arsenal, Benfica, Barcelona for a bit as well, PSG, but hey, they locked it in in the end. First title in 33 years. Congrats to Napoli. Oh, and they beat Fiorentina as well. <laughs> Ossiman converting one of two penalties that he took in this one. One was all they needed, and he took his total up to 23 from 28 appearances in Serie A this season. At the top, all we care about now is the top four European places, etc. And with that loss for Roma and both Milan clubs winning, they risk missing out on Europe all of a sudden. Crazy. Four matches to go here, and they are level on points with Atalanta. And then, of course, at the bottom, Sampdoria. Ugh. Horrid season for them. Cremonese, still a chance for them to survive. Spezia, 
definitely a chance for them to survive. If I was to guess, and this is just guesswork, this isn't a prediction or anything, I would guess that Salernitana and Empoli probably going to be okay, whereas Lecce, Verona, they're not out of the woods just yet. Anything can happen in these last four fixtures. Sampdoria do have a game in hand, but uh What a start to Newcastle versus Arsenal. Hey, rapid stuff. In the first 10 minutes, you had Newcastle surging, hitting the post early, nearly getting a penalty, but for Kavanaugh reviewing it and seeing that it did indeed come off of Kivor's leg rather than his arm. You could see his thigh meat wobble from the ball hitting it. <laughs> but I mean, that didn't stop Alan Shearer from fuming at Dermot Gallagher. Poor guy was taking his anger out on a retired referee. But anyway, when you have a magician like Martin Odegaard who can conjure something out of nothing, then you always have a chance to turn the tide of the match. And that's exactly what he did. 14 minutes in, he struck low past Pope to make it one nil and kill Newcastle's momentum. Big play from a player the whole team has been looking to lately, given his great form at that point. That was five goals in five matches. And the back and forth nature of this match continued. Ramsdale was called upon on a few occasions to bail out Arsenal, as was Pope for Newcastle. Both keepers had to earn their pay. However, I think this match was won in the midfield as I thought Jorginho had a very, very good performance, as did Xhaka. Later, a quick counter from Arsenal saw Martinelli burst down the left, beat his man and square two Shar to poke it into his own goal. Unfortunate, a bit of a what were you thinking moment from Shar, as nine times out of 10, he would side for that clear. 2-0 Arsenal, the chase is still on, only the second time Newcastle had lost at home, by the way, this season. Liverpool, they're playing with where they play some of their personnel, and they're getting some decent results of late. This weekend, they took on Brentford, who, as you know, is not an easy opponent in the slightest, and from a Mo Salah goal, they got the 1-0 win. Not the cleanest of finishes from Salah, at least by his own standards, as he scuffed it, and Rea nearly recovered to save it, but the build-up was nice. Great vision from Fabinho to pick out Van Dijk, and great decision-making from Van Dijk to unselfishly head across goal for Salah. By the way, that was his 100th goal at Anfield, the Centurion. You want another 1-0 with an iconic Premier League scorer contributing? Harry Kane got the winner for struggling Tottenham this weekend as they are starting to show some signs of improvement. They drew United after going 2-0 down. They nearly drew Liverpool from 3-0 down. And this weekend, they beat Palace 1-0. No comeback, guys? You're getting boring. <laughs> Camera died, but yeah. <laughs> As for Kane, his goal lifted him above Wayne Rooney in the all-time Premier League goal-scoring standings. He's still behind Shearer, of course, but 209 goals, huge feat. And he also broke the single-season record for headed goals, if that's something you're interested in. A bit of trivia for you, if you will. He's converted with his head 10 times this season now, beating out Big Dunk Ferguson's old record from the 97-98 season. Aston Villa were on such a great run, but after losing to United last week, they fell once again away to Wolves, 1-0. Shout out Lopetegui, by the way. He's really lifted that side. Remember when they were in the bowels of the league, down in the relegation zone? It was looking scary. In January, they were in 19th, and they've managed to climb up to 13th. They had just three wins in their first 19 matches, man. Now, 7-16. and 16. Look, it's not exactly title-winning form, but they are certainly improved. Manchester City 1-2-1 over Leeds in a Groundhog Day stretch of eight minutes in the first half. Mahrez coming inside from the right and cutting the ball back to Gundogan to hit it low into the corner. The only difference between the two goals. The first goal was hit first time, the second he took a touch, and they were in the opposite corners of the goal. That's it though. <laughs> Later, City won a penalty and the regular taker in Holland kindly gave the ball to Gundogan to complete his hat-trick, but he failed to convert. That pissed off Pep, and he would have gone nuclear after seeing Rodrigo then score for Leeds. 2-1 win still, though. And Big Sam, he was behind Pep on this occasion, despite what he said in his press conference. Nice to have Big Sam back, eh? Premier League heritage. And Frank Lampard has done it. He got his first taste of victory for Chelsea. Nay, his first points for Chelsea since his return. After six consecutive losses, Lampard did not become 007, a record of zero wins, zero draws, and seven losses. He is now uh, 106. Not the same ring to it there, is there? Anyway, he made some changes against Bournemouth and they paid off with Gallagher stepping in and scoring only for Vigna 
to equalize before the half was up. Bournemouth actually looked the more dangerous squad in this match still for a long stretches of it. So it's not job done yet for Lampard as far as their play goes. But scoring goals has been their biggest issue and Badia Shield getting a goal to win it in the 82nd was massive. From there, João Felix came on, linked with Sterling and rolled one in for 3-1 Chelsea. Turning point, we'll see they have Forrest at home next, which you would fancy them to win, right? Right? And finally, we saw Manchester United looking bad again against West Ham, and De Gea looking even worse. The howler of all howlers, as he was somehow beat once again, low at the near post, from distance, from a strike that should never find its way into the goal. Look at this, man. This is just brutal. Anyway, West Ham were pretty dominant at times, especially early in that second half, and were good value for their win, even if it was a pretty shit goal. <laughs> and that loss for United could prove to be very costly, as they are now just one point above Liverpool. Isn't that insane? In one of Liverpool's more chaotic seasons, they could potentially catch United still, but hey, Brighton to pass them all, right? At the bottom, Southampton are all but relegated, and look at that bottom five. What a relegation scrap we are going to have in the final few matches here. Hey. Southampton Miracle, I'll back it. Let's go. The Copa del Rey final, look. It's Osasuna versus Real Madrid, heavy favorites against a team who had already accomplished far more than anyone would have expected by simply being in the final, you know? And all of that said, Osasuna fought hard. Rodrigo was in the mood for this cup final as he put in a man of the match performance. After just two minutes, he was set up by his compatriot Vinicius, what a setup it was. My god, Vinicius is just disgustingly good. The way he beat those two to Osasuna defenders, took the ball to the touchline, then rolled it in front for Rodrigo to convert. Stunning assist. Osasuna didn't just roll over and die. Why? Because Osasuna nunca se rinde. <laughs> in fact, a former Real Madrid Castilla player and Lucas Toro scored the equalizer for Osasuna in the second half, only for Vinicius to go crazy down the left once again, unplayable at times, and it looked like they would repeat the first goal, but the ball found its way back to Valverde, his shot was deflected into the path of Rodrigo, and he made no mistake once again. There is an argument to be made that Rodrigo was one of Real Madrid's most clutch goal scorers alongside Karim Benzema. What a guy, he has a knack for showing up when they need him. So, two on Real Madrid, they get the win, and that is their 20th Copa del Rey title. Congrats to the Real fans out there. By the way, if you're confused as to why I just jumped to Germany all of a sudden, there is no La Liga. So there's nothing to talk about in Spain. So, the last time we spoke of the Bundesliga, a few weeks ago, we made note of what's going on at the bottom. And one of those teams has since caught form and brought themselves out of the bottom three. Yes, Schalke played away to Mainz on Friday, a difficult fixture. Just ask Bayern, who lost 3-1 there. But Schalke won 3-2. That's three wins in their previous four fixtures now for Schalke. Will they escape and maintain Bundesliga football? Their final three matches are against... Oof, Bayern, Eintracht Frankfurt, and Leipzig. That's gonna be tough. They could be screwed over by the schedule here. <laughs> also, a few weeks ago, we spoke about the lovely run that Chabi Alonso and Leverkusen were on, unbeaten in 14 matches going into their game against Köln at home this weekend. You'd expect them to hit 15 and round it out nicely. That's a lovely number, right? Wrong. Unfortunately for them, as Köln sandwiched Adley's goal in the 28th minute with two of their own from Davy Selke. 2-1 win for Köln, away, massive result, well, for their pride, I guess. Europe is out of reach for them, they're going to be safe. Well, that did dent Leverkusen's chances of catching Freiburg. Speaking of, Freiburg fell to RB Leipzig at home as well, for the second time in four days. RB Leipzig beat Freiburg in their own home, but at least this weekend, Christian Strike and the boys can say, ah, at least it was just 1-0 this time, as Kevin Campbell scored what would be the winner in the 73rd minute. That other game I was talking about was the Pokal semi-final, of which Leipzig won 5-1 away. Wild. They're in the final again. Augsburg beat Union this weekend, a disappointing one for Union, of course, but at least with Wolfsburg losing, more on that in a second, Union know that they will, at the very least, next season have Conference League football. They're still in fourth, and if they can hold off Freiburg, they could be in the Champions League. Funnily enough, they play each other on the 13th in what will be a massive match when it comes to European qualification. Well, not qualification, more like European competition sorting. Who's going in what pot, basically. Bayern played away to Werder Bremen, and while they labored in front of goal again, 
they did indeed get the 2-1 win away. Leroy Sané and Serge Gnabry got the goals for Bayern, but like I said, they had to work for it. Curious to see if they will pursue a real striker this summer, as goals are hard to come by. And by real striker, I mean an out-and-out -out finisher. Goals were not hard to come by for Borussia Dortmund this weekend. After the disappointment and controversy of their Bochum match, they hosted Wolfsburg this weekend, and my god, they ran riot at Signal Iduna Park. Adeyemi got a brace, one of which was a header he had no business converting. <laughs> that man leapt. Sebastian Aller got the second, his fifth of the season. Bellingham also got a brace. Malin scored again, but Julian Brandt, man, a hat-trick of assists for him in this game as his stupendous season continues. Nine goals and nine assists across all competitions. 6-0 Dortmund, and that's with a penalty that they failed to convert as well. Could have been seventh heaven for those boys. So here you are, here's a look at the standings as with three matches remaining. It is tight at the bottom. Stuttgart and Bochum on 28 points. Hertha with the win over Stuttgart this weekend to keep themselves close with three matches to go. Bayer's lead is just a single point in this two horse race. Shall we compare their schedules for some context of what's to come? Dortmund have Gladbach at home, Augsburg away and Mainz at home, not easy. Bayern, also tough. Schalke at the Allianz Arena, who are fighting for their lives and finding form. Leipzig at home, who always gives them a tough time and are in decent form. And Köln away. This will be delicious. As will this week, guys. As a reminder, the Champions League semi-finals kick off on Tuesday with Real Madrid versus Manchester City. Speaking of delicious, eh? That'll be nice. And we will do watch-alongs for both matches. I can't wait. All right, everyone. Thanks for watching. Have yourself a great week. And we'll see you soon. Ciao.